Today, we are delighted to be speaking with Dr. Brent Strawn. Dr. Strawn is a professor of Old Testament at the Candler School of Theology, Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. He earned his doctorate in Old Testament from Princeton Theological Seminary and currently serves as academic editor and translator uh, on the editorial board of the Common English Bible. In addition, Dr. Strawn has edited and contributed to several volumes, including his role as editor-in-chief in the award-winning Oxford Encyclopedia of the Bible. He is author of five books, including Our Text Today, The Old Testament is Dying, A Diagnosis and Recommended Treatment. Brent, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Brian. It's great to be here. Um, so... You go to pains in the book to um, talk about the public opinion of the Bible and how uh, biblical knowledge is kind of on the outs. And you also, um, you also speak about use of, ser- uh, use of the Old Testament in sermons mm-hmm. and the common lectionary. And you spend a good portion. And a lot of research went into the book. So... If I could ask you to take a moment and explain what prompted you uh, to write this book and why you felt it was important to write it. Yeah, so a couple things, really. One is, I think, thinking about my classroom and what I was doing in the classroom, and particularly in this Intro to Old Testament class that we teach here at Emory, a year-long introductory course for first-year students. Thinking through my, my task in that course, uh, while I was driving in on my commute, listening to this wonderful course on linguistics by John McWhorter, who's a fantastic teacher and lecturer, and uh, and that's saying a lot. The course is is on linguistics, but really engaging, funny guy, and everything. And and it suddenly clicked in my mind that that what McWhorter was discussing about in terms of language, language development, language acquisition, language growth, contact, even decline and death, there was something fundamentally similar uh, in that to what I was doing in the classroom. And suddenly I realized maybe what I was teaching was a language, um, not the language of Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic or something like that, but the language of scripture, and that that should affect how I taught, and uh, that maybe then I would need to think more in terms of language acquisition and, and learning from linguistics, how people learn languages, especially adults, and also then it suddenly clicked in my mind that maybe the language I was teaching was in decline, and endangered, and maybe even potentially uh, in in threat of dying, um, which then sort of upped the ante significantly. So that that was probably the primary connection um, in terms of kind of the theory or or germ of the idea of the book in terms of language. Uh, life cycle in the Old Testament. But another factor was really my experience teaching in local churches uh, where I just found more and more and more evidence that fewer and fewer and fewer Christians really knew pretty much anything about the Bible and that the ones who were frequenting my classes tended to be uh, quite old. Um, And that was a sign, I think, according to linguistic study, that a language is definitely threatened and endangered and and maybe soon extinct if only the older folks speak it. And if only the older folks speak it and they can't speak it very well, then you've got a real problem on your hands. And you talk about this um, morbidity or death of the Old Testament in the first portion of the book, the first three chapters. And so as you were researching that, was there anything that surprised you? Was there anything that obviously disappointed you or uh, anything that gave you hope uh, that the ultimate conclusion, we can resurrect this dead language or dying language? Yeah, the, the research in the first three chapters and in the, in the, si- uh, the second three where I <clears throat> talk about other signs of morbidity and outside the walls of the church, these were disappointing. And... Um, I guess I expected them outside the walls of the church, and of course I was familiar or had a sense of the problem inside the walls of the church as well. But it was it was disappointing, and um, I realized that the case was pretty bad, and also that I needed to make the case as strongly as possible because uh, Christians still give a lot of lip service to Scripture, and they don't want anyone to tell them that the Bible's endangered or it's threatened to die. Of course, no, that can't be true. 
but this is, uh, I think, just sort of at least semi-empirically true, right? My, my yeah. chapters are, are in some ways anecdotal, but some ways semi-empirical. And uh, obviously I couldn't survey the, the millions of Christians in the States, let alone the billions across, sure. the, across the world. But um, I did think that the, the data was suggested that the decline was at least in certain pockets of North American Christianity. And that, that's what I'm looking at. Certain pockets of North American Christianity. That the decline was actually quite significant the the patient was very very sick um and more than that was really was really dying so the book was really um kind of emerges out of my deep sadness about that situation and not just not just the death of the old testament because as i say in the book as you know the old testament dies the new testament is not far behind and my concern ultimately is with the with the life of christian scripture and so it was very, it is a very sad to me book, uh, and yet also I think hopefully, hopefully hopeful. Um, a couple of people have written me about the book, or friends have said, you know, I found the book deeply saddening and also uh, hopeful at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think probably that was what I was hoping would, would, would be communicated in the book. And uh, you talk about the, that death of the whole the whole Bible as a consequence of the death of the Old Testament, and particularly in reference to kind of the attacks of the new atheism. So um, would you say that the, uh, the extreme misunderstanding of the Old Testament um, in the new atheists and the effectiveness of their critique is uh, directly tied to the lack of biblical knowledge among not only non-Christians, but the church. Yeah, definitely so. Definitely so. You know, the currency uh, in the contemporary culture is very much uh, technological, medical, scientific. That's, 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 that's where life matters. You know, in my university, Research One University, the majority of effort, energy, and funding it's not in the humanities, uh, and certainly not in divinity, but it's in the medical school, um, and it's in the biological sciences, and so on and so forth. So we're, we're, we're striving hard to live, live longer lives and healthier lives, uh, while the humanities and, and other such things suffer a decline in our country and in higher ed, so that I worry we'll never, we'll, we'll live longer lives, but we really won't know what to do with them. Um, mm -hmm. other look at our cell phones, you know, uh, and, and find some new apps, you know, but, um, it is the case therefore that, that with the decline of scriptural knowledge and the increase of these other sorts of discourses, the, there's a real problem if we can't somehow bridge the discourses, bring them together or make them talk. And so without a robust knowledge of scripture, for instance, someone who is who's adept in the language of technology and science and so on and so forth, who, who dislikes the language of theology or whatever, can easily sort of win in that kind of discussion. And not only win in the general culture um, that may be increasingly secularized, but also win with Christians who don't know their scriptures. So the signs of morbidity that are so um, poignant and powerful, I mean, the New Atheist, people like Richard Dawkins, they're immensely influential, and they're brilliant people. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. there's no doubt about it. They're brilliant people. They can convince you just with their brilliance, and if you throw in some British accent on top, I mean, it's a done, <laughs> it's a done deal, you know. But the hopeful part about these signs of morbidity is that if you know the full language of Scripture, you can actually begin to redress those wrongs. So, for instance... Um, you know, the, the big debate, uh, especially for so many Christians, or a struggle for so many Christians, even faithful ones, let alone ones that are sort of nominal or worried about this, is, is, is um, on things like science, scripture, evolution, etc. Mm -hmm. And to me, in my mind, so much of that is sort of misconstrued, not only by someone like Dawkins, who really doesn't understand a robust doctrine of creation, but also by a lot of Christians who think the only thing the Bible says about creation is in Genesis 1, and I have to believe that in some sort of literal way, whatever that word means. And they don't have even the foggiest, even though they do, foggiest idea that John chapter 1 says something at least somewhat different than Genesis 1. And then what about Proverbs 8? 
What about Psalm 74? Or what about Job 38? Or Psalm 104? Or Colossians 1? All these texts and others speak about creation. They don't all agree exactly on all the details, and they certainly don't all just recapitulate Genesis 1. Hmm. In other words, even the Bible is thinking about creation in kind of a flexible way. Um, that Christians should be able to think about creation flexibly as well, without without waffling in the least on the fundamentally consistent thing across all those texts, which is that God created heaven and earth. You know what I mean? Hmm. So, so many people get tripped up and leave their faith because of Genesis 1. It's like, hey, you know what? Keep reading. I mean, the Bible has more than just that one text in it. I mean, you know, lots of people only read the first chapter of a book, but that doesn't mean it's the only chapter in the book. So it's, uh, again, knowing that, knowing, having a robust understanding of the language of Scripture, the whole kind of text, you know, really allows you to navigate problems that, in the end of the day, I mean, with all due respect to Dawkins, seem to me simplistic, you know, and easily uh, dealt with. I mean, easily dealt with. If someone's major beef with with Christianity and Scripture's evolution, I mean, give me a break. That's really child's play. We can handle that. We can handle hmm. that. Hmm. And you you talk about that a bit, um, the lack of fluency linguistically, if we might say. Um, and you talk about this idea of Marcionites old and new. Um, if you could explain uh, for our listeners what Mars what uh, who Marcion was, what Marcionitism is, um, and then in addition to that, would you would you say it's fair to uh, to say that much of the contemporary church is involved in this kind of quasi Marcionite practice? And where do you see it being unintentional, and where is it intentional? Yeah, great question. I- I, Marcin was this, uh, it was uh, evidently the son of a bishop, you know how it goes with pastor's kids and all that. <laughs> <laughs> he died around around 160 AD, uh, but was a, evidently a wealthy ship owner, and he, and he went to Rome, and he was a very devout Christian in his, in his way, and um, had some questions, some theological perspectives, and he was summoned before the church at Rome to explain himself about these and when he did, they decided to excommunicate him uh, as, a, as a heretic. His, his ideas were basically that the Old Testament and New Testament presented an irreconcilable perspective on God. His primary work was known as the Antitheses, where he uh, listed one some text from the Old Testament and then its antithesis in the New Testament. And he just sort of laid these out, and you draw your own conclusions, but the conclusion is clearly that these things don't go together, and the Old Testament stuff is bad, the New Testament stuff is good. So that the Old Testament uh, God, who he thought was real, by the way, just wasn't the, the true God. It was a real God, but it was like a junior God, kind of, and who really was kind of bad. And so that material, the Old Testament and the Old Testament God, needed to be dispensed with. And then out of the blue, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus just dropped out of heaven and just showed up in this synagogue in Capernaum and started preaching. And that Jesus was to reveal the true, the true God, the alien God. Uh, who no one had known or experienced prior to Jesus. So um, he had his antitheses and he had his gospel. That's what he called it. His gospel, though, was, and, and this is a perfect example of the Old Testament dying, New Testament dying with it. His, his gospel was uh, only one gospel, not all four. It was the Gospel of Luke. And even that part of, even Luke, he couldn't get in unabridged. There was too much in Luke that was, was tied inseparably to the Old Testament. For instance, the infancy narratives in the first several chapters. Those had to go, because those look exactly like the old patriarchs and matriarchs of the Bible, don't they? Um, Barren women suddenly given children. And then there's, uh, you know, Simeon's, the Nunc Dimittis. Now you have set your servant free to depart in peace. For my eyes have seen the Savior whom you prepared for the whole world to see. The, a light to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Right? I mean, that's just no way can Marcion handle that. So that's got to go. And you start in 4, chapter 4, Jesus dropping down out of nowhere, you know, um, like an alien himself. So he has to take all that out. And, and parts of, of the Pauline corpus he can't deal with, too. Some of the letters have to go. So he has basically a severely restricted corpus of the New Testament, part of the New Testament. That's his gospel. But he was a very effective preacher, 
and the way his his theology worked, uh, he was very ascetic. They 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 did not encourage reproduction among their followers. So that meant the only way for the Marcionite Church to grow was to steal from other other flocks, other Christian communities, really. And they did that, and they were very effective. And the Marcionite Church has lasted for hundreds of years. And your question is really getting at the fact that Marcion's ghost still lives all over the place, and he probably inhabits most churches um, mm -hmm. in one way or the other. And and it's and it's felt anytime someone says, "Well, that God in the Old Testament seems so mean, but God in the New Testament seems so nice," or Jesus is really about mercy and love. God is like about wrath and judgment. And when these things are polarized, separated, bifurcated. And then they're also localized in their respective testaments or with their respective member of the Trinity. This is really um, Marcion's head um, being reared up. And it's, it's a, lots of times I think it is um, naive and therefore ignorant. Uh, that doesn't make it good. You know, it's definitely not benevolent, but it's, but it's just ignorant. And then other times I think it's quite, quite significantly maybe intentional and therefore malevolent, though I want to give the benefit of the doubt and say most people who are functional Marcionites don't, don't mean to be. Um, sure. And they're just falling into, the, into that trap that, that Marcion fell into. Hmm. And so one group you talk about, uh, you devote a whole chapter to in the contemporary church is what you call these happyologists, <laughs> um, which is, uh, for the audience, the prosperity gospel, um, preachers of the prosperity gospel in different ways. And you utilize this linguistic analogy to talk about how they speak a um, expanded pigeon or maybe a creole. Um, and so if you could take a moment to explain a little bit what you mean by that and explain how that plays itself out. And then also, alternatively, do you see places where the Old Testament is being spoken of correctly? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, just super briefly, languages change all the time, diachronically, just through use. And that's partly why we have new translations all the time, why I, why I joined the Common English Bible Editorial Board. I mean, why, why do we need another one? It's because yeah. the language changes, we use contractions, we, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The Common English Bible, for instance, is the first English translation to ever use contractions. Um, oh. and even God uses contractions in the Hebrew, in the uh, in the uh, in the Common English Bible. You know, so um, <laughs> God's getting a little more informal, I guess. <laughs> but, over time, uh, that's right. Over time, but one of the ways languages change is through contact with other languages. It gives rise to things like loan words or loan phrases, like we will be talking in English and we'll say, man, what a day, right? But hey, say la vie, right? Uh, so it's French loan word. That's that's life, you know. And it's, it's French, but it's now in English, and English speakers understand it. Um, so language contact can often lead to, uh, especially between two unequal groups, can, can produce the need to uh, communicate. And one of the, the results of that is a, it's called a pidgin language. That's a really reduced uh, language that allows for the bare, um, you know, aspects of communication to exist between two groups, but there it's neither of the languages proper, uh, the, the, the parents as it were, and the parents contribute unequal DNA. The, the parent who is most powerful, the, who conquered the weaker group, or who controls the, the primary aspects of the trade agreement, or uh, who's enslaved the other group, they contribute most of the lexical stock to the language, and the other one has to just a little bit. So they, that contribution constructs a pigeon, very reduced, lacks nuance, lacks tons of verb forms, lacks tons of vocabulary. You just, it's just for bare communication. You just can't get work done in either of the parent languages that's, that's done in the pigeon. It's just too small. Um, and so pigeons can be spoken, and then they can actually grow up. If most pigeons die out, but if they grow up, they are called a creole. And a creole language is, is a pigeon language that acquired native speakers 
and those named speakers then because they have to go off to school and talk about algebra and then ask their you know boyfriend out on a date or their girlfriend to prom or something they've got to have more language than just was with, with that little pigeon to start with so a creole is this expanded pigeon that includes all kinds of new stuff that again wasn't in either of the original ones and that new stuff is is fully regularized um, so if you make up a new verb it's a regular verb, you know, you don't make up an irregular verb, those are the worst, you know, no one wants that. So, that that linguistic discussion is really important because to go back to the New Atheists and Marcion for a minute, what I think they represent are pidgin languages. So, yeah. Dawkins, the New Atheists, they know a bit of the Bible, of course they do, that's because they're talking, they're writing chapters about it, they've read it at least once. And they've got, they're making some points against it. And some of those points are not entirely wrong. They, they get some aspects of the Bible right. But the Bible is this less important language to their other language, which is not just science, but logical consistency or, or whatever it is. And that's the super straight, the dominant language. And it's being brought to bear on the little tiny language of Scripture. And then what's happening is this little pigeon is being produced. So... Dawkins scores points, but it's against a pigeonized version of the of the Bible. He doesn't know the whole thing, and not only that, but his 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 own kind of commitments to science and, and evolutionary biology or whatever are impinging upon and really reducing the Bible to to what he wants to say. So he sc he scores some points. He gets some things right, but that's because pigeons always have some lexical stock from the from the substrate. Mm. Certainly, the Marcionites are also like Marcion just can't handle the complexity of the Bible. So his his language of, of logical consistency, what goes together, what what he thinks is antith antithetical or not, that's what drives it. And what you end up with is this pigeon, this little gospel, right? So those are pigeons. But in the case of the prosperity gospel, I think, uh, as you say, what we have is a creole. So we've had a pigeonization where the Bible is basically about health, wealth, and prosperity. Um, that's a great, re greatly reduced understanding of Scripture, right? It's whatever this big super straight is, it's probably consumeristic capitalism, uh, upwardly mobile middle-class Americanism, uh, American civil religion, uh, etc. And then there's some Bible in there too, and they come together and there's pigeon is produced. That The Bible is primarily about our health, wealth, and prosperity. Which is... There, it's there. Just like this, like some of the stuff, the bad stuff that that Dawkins notes is there, but it's there's more than that there, right? <laughs> and so yeah, then, sure. if the if the if that pigeon, the health, wealth, and prosperity pigeon gets native speakers, then it can become expanded and become a creole, and the creole again gets fully regularized. So what you find in the ha in the happyologists is not just that they're picking up on some things that are in the Bible. Of course they are. Of course they are, especially insofar as they want to preach scripture. But there's also this other stuff in scripture that their new language, their Creole, can't possibly account for. And that's because it's already, the Creole is two steps removed, pigeon and Creole, two steps removed from its ancestors. And its ancestor, that is scripture, was only a smaller piece of the puzzle anyway. So when you, when you read some of these folk, um, what you find is a fully regularized language. If you say this, if you claim this, if you say this word, God has to do that. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a regular verb, right? That's a fully regular verb. If you do this, then God... The Bible's just full of irregular verbs, though. I mean, Job is the pre preeminent example I talk about in the book. Job does the right things, and since he says the right words... And he doesn't get the deal, you know. He doesn't get the Learjet and all the rest. So there's that's that's an irregular verb that the Creole language, the new Happyology Creole, can't account for. But it's in the Scripture, right? So that shows that the Creole language is is several steps removed, at least two steps removed from the from the original. And I think it's therefore more problematic. The Happyologists, even though they're Christians and they're trying. They are actually more of a potential damage to the language of Scripture than Dawkins and Marcion are. Mm. I mean, I just want to leave that out there. That that even though they're preachers, they're actually more of a damage than than uh, than the than the others. So, um, so I think that's really a, a, a fascinating aspect to me in my learning about the book that came out, um, the Creolization, as a particularly problematic aspect.
of prosperity gospel preachers and also just the, the, the problem that poses for, for a proper acquisition and uh, you know re resurrection of the language of scripture. Mm. As far as who speaks it well, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it might be easy on the one hand to be cynical about this and say, oh, no one speaks it well. Or to be nostalgic about it. Ah, the apostles, the early church fathers and mothers, they spoke it fluently. And I think it's probably clear that in many cases, the last the last bit at least is true, that, that people like Augustine and Jerome and Gregory of Nyssa or whomever like that, they, they were they were sort of living libraries, you know, walking concordances. I mean, the, the kind of dexterity and uh, fluency that they manifest in the Bible is just stunning. Um, Tertullian wrote five books against Marcion and just, you know, destroys Marcion's theology. And it's because Tertullian knows the Bible, fan, you know, fantastically times better than Marcion does. And Marcion was no slouch, right? So there, I think there is a, a, a temptation even in my thinking, to nostalgic, you know, just to be nostalgic about those those old time folk, um, even and I, but I, but I think there's some truth in that. But I also think there's truth in the fact that there are saints even to this day, right, who know scripture well, who think through scripture, whose whose language is sort of you know peppered with scripture, and whose first thought when when they encounter an issue, even an issue, a difficult issue of public policy, is not what did I hear about it on CNN or Fox News or on, um, you know, Good Morning America? But, man, I wonder, wonder how that intersects with the Book of Ruth. Or um, that reminds me of the parable of the unjust judge. Or, you know what I mean? That, that's the kind of fluency that I'm hoping for. And that kind of fluency, I think, is a lifetime project. So I do think there are definitely, praise God, pockets, not only of, of, of individuals, but of, of churches who are really trying to give um, great attention to scripture in its fullest, most robust vision. And uh, those are signs of life. Those are signs that the Old Testament is not dying, um, but is, is surviving. And that's so important because the one thing a language needs to survive is speakers. A large group of people who practice speaking it all the time. So a, surviving, a, a language to sort of survive in a book form is a whole different scenario. You know, Latin, for instance. The, my kids took Latin in public school, and the Latin teachers were always telling them, oh, Latin's not a dead language. You know, yes, it is. It's a dead language. You know what I mean? Just because you're teaching it doesn't make it alive, right? I mean, that's great that you're teaching it. That's great. I love it. I teach biblical Hebrew, right, or, or Koine Greek. But those languages aren't living languages anymore. Those are, those are preserved languages. A real language to survive, to be a living language, you'd have to have a bunch of people who speak Latin every day, who go down to Kroger and order their groceries in Latin, or call up Direct TV and they press three for Latin, you know, for the for the customer service. That's a living language. And so churches that, that actually are trying and practicing the language of Scripture, those are communities where the language of Scripture will survive, especially if they have people who are young and who are yeah. Children, or who are bearing children, and they're teaching their language, that language of faith, to their children. Those places are going to survive, and the language of Scripture will survive there. So I do think there's pockets like that. Thanks be to God, and and I'm always looking for more. So you know, if you know some, let me know. <laughs> um, and you you touched on it a bit there with uh, the ending, talking about the fluency with biblical language and kind of how that would look. And in yeah. the last chapter, um, you give a few recommendations for how to revive this dead language and how we, because I believe that everyone in the church would like to be, can yeah. be fluent speakers of the Bible and the Old Testament specifically, which is where a lot of people struggle. So if you could just give a few practical ways that um, churches and individuals can begin speaking again the language of the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> first, just a footnote to that question, because I think it's important to point out. You're right that people feel the struggle acutely with the Old Testament. And I'm not completely sure why that is. I mean, I, I have, of course, my ideas about it. But at least in part, 
people feel, for whatever reason, they're closer to the New Testament. Of course, they're really not, right? I mean, in terms of, of chronological distance, 2,000 years versus 2,500 years, what's, you know, what's yeah. the difference? Uh, but for some reason, they feel that way. Well, I think they feel that way primarily because they've heard the New Testament constantly, even incessantly, in church, and they haven't with the Old Testament. So that's that's a that's a sign that the language death is in fact facilitated or or furthered by neglect in the church if if pastors don't constantly talk about the old testament as much as the new testament of course people be like what's that that's a foreign country over there you know that's that feels dif different and distant from me Whereas if they were constantly talking about the Old Testament and neglecting the New Testament in equal measure, people would feel that way about the New Testament. Yeah. What's that? I don't get it. I don't really know. Um, so it's always the case that the ancient languages are the hardest and most difficult to acquire, right? The, they're also the most complicated languages. And the Bible, both Old and New Testament, is an old, ancient, complicated language. I mean, how do you hold together something like Job with the you know the joy of some of the psalms right um or the the paranetic aspects of paul's epistles you know uh pray without ceasing give thanks in everything you know well you know the psalmists aren't giving thanks in everything uh, they're complaining a lot and so is job so how do you how do you hold those things together well that's a that's a sign of a complicated language an old complicated language it has as it were an irregular verb in here which says sometimes you're happy and can thank give thanks without ceasing and other times you can't mm -hmm. and that's a complicated verbal form to learn it's like a really strange you know version of the verb to be that gets flexed in all sorts of different ways in future forms and past forms and present forms but simple people and Creole speakers don't like that. They want one to be right and want the other to be wrong, you know. So ancient archaic languages are hard to learn, and the Bible's one of those. Um, but in terms of how then to kind of get after that, because if that's the case, then language teaching, language acquisition is going to be difficult. How do we, how do we learn it and, and redress this problem? I mean, I think on the one hand, it's just, it's just not, it's not brain surgery. It's really quite simple. And it exists at both the corporate and individual levels. So at the corporate level, at the level of, of churches, and also I would include here uh, church-related institutions like seminaries that are training clergy, et cetera, what we need is, you know, regular um, and extensive exposure and use of the Old Testament in Christian, in key, in key moments of Christian faith and practice. So for most Christians, at least in, in the churches that I'm familiar with in, in my life, that, t that means in church. That means, you know, in the worship service. Not only there, because it's going to take more than that, but in the worship service, we have to have more sermons that are based on the Old Testament, maybe, it, maybe exclusively, but, but at least in, in integrally intertwined in positive ways with the New Testament. We need more hymns and songs that are based on the Old Testament. And we also need more um, reading from the Old Testament, extensive reading. That that's that's just an hour, you know, or maybe an hour and a half, two hours if you're if you're really lengthy in your worship service. But that's not enough on its own. That's kind of like that we're a lecture, you know. It's kind of like a language teacher giving a lecture for a while, um, not exclusively, of course, because when the singing of the psalms, that there the congregation is participating. But you've got to have also opportunities to practice the language. So if you're taking French, you might go to class. You might hear your teacher teach you a bunch about French paradigms and the passé, composé, you know, the past tense or whatever. But then you have to go to language lab and you have to listen, you know, with your headphones on. And then you have to practice saying things in class. So input and output are, are, are both important. Singing is one way that, that the community of faith can, can practice, can sing back. Small groups are another way, right, where, where they can practice the language. Missional acts, you know, um, working in the soup kitchen or participating in some other justice ministry or going on a mission trip or Habitat for Humanity. These are other ways we practice the language of faith with our bodies. Um, but that, that would say the kind of, that's the corporate thing, intentional and extensive use and exposure to the Old Testament at key, formative, regular moments of Christian faith and practice. The, the, the other thing is, 
I guess I would say is uh, that there's more to say about that, but that's the that's the most important I think at the corporate level. At the individual level, it's just the case that you're not going to learn a language if you're not constantly immersed in it. And so um, it's just kind of again simple stuff that they taught me when I was a little kid in Sunday school that you got to read your Bible every day. (laughs) You got to read your Bible every day, and you know some days it's going to be totally profound, and other days it's going to be totally perfunctory. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But that's just the way it is because that's the way it works with language. Sometimes with language you're just you know you're going to Kroger and you're buying toilet paper, and other times in the language you are reading Shakespeare, Mm -hmm. right? Or you're writing a poem yourself. I mean, there's different, you know, sometimes you have these high moments and just regular moments. I mean, but the language has to be used. You have to steep in it. And one hour at church on Sunday, even two if you throw in a small group or something, it's not enough scripture to fund a Christian life. So Christians have to be intentional, and they have to be intentional about deep long-term exposure. And I think... uh, not only that, but in, in the kinds of, of uh, exposure they get. So for me, speaking personally, several years back, um, I started reading The Daily Office. And uh, The Daily Office is, you know, a set of prayers and psalms and uh, Old Testament gospel and epistle readings, you know, all framed with, with sentences from Scripture, confession of sin, prayers. And I do my best to read The Daily Office every day. If you read the Daily Office every day, in a month, you go through the entire Psalter. Every, every month, you've read all 150 Psalms. And then in two years, you've read a good bit of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Not everything. Even in, the, even in the Daily Office, you don't cover everything. But especially with the Psalms, it seems to me that in my brain, I'm trying to learn the language of the Psalms. I'm trying to speak the Psalms. And I'm just trying to get it into my head. And again, some days the daily office is profoundly meaningful, and other days I'm just getting through it, you know. <laughs> but it's a discipline. It's a it's a Christian discipline for me, and it's it's one way Christians can can try. It doesn't have to be the daily office. It can be one year Bible or five year Bible. I mean, it's the the time frame is not it's not it's not important to do it fast. It's just important to do it well and regularly. That that's what I would lift up on the individual level. And I guess the final thing I'd say on this, Brian, is that fluency, again, is a lifetime project. So, you know, I don't claim to be fluent. I may, I think there are fluent speakers out there, and I, I, I'm thankful for, the, for those, you know, um, 7,000 who haven't yet bowed the knee to Baal or kiss his lips. But, um, but the way towards, one of the best ways towards fluency or towards greater language knowledge is to teach. You know, I mean, I took Hebrew in college. I didn't really learn Hebrew until I was teaching Hebrew. That's a whole different <laughs> level of engagement. So people shouldn't shirk the opportunity to teach Sunday school or teach children's church or teach VBS or, or teach their small group because it's going to require, it's going to be work, it's gonna, but it's going to require them to get into the language at a deeper level. They're going to learn stuff. Are they going to make mistakes? Sure, every language teacher does. I mean, every time I teach a class, a student asks me a question, I don't know. But then I go back and I try to figure it out, and then I try to learn that better for next time. So those are those are three things that come to mind uh, that I think are pragmatic, hopefully helpful tools towards towards fluency. Well, thank you so much. I know we all desire to be fluent speakers of the Bible, and um, hopefully someday we all will be. Yes. Um, here at Unitas Fide, we have um, this emphasis on the unity of the church. So if I could pose to you just this final question, um, what would it mean for the church to be united, in your opinion? And how would Christians recognize this unity? And what can we be doing as Christians to pursue the unity for which Jesus prayed in John 17? Yeah, wow, that's a great question. For me, for me, I think... Well, as a professor, of course, I think several things simultaneously, right? <laughs> but, but I think, um, for me, as a Bible professor, so much of Christian thought centers on Scripture. And so Scripture is a, is a central uniting element. That, that Christianity is a lot of things, but among the things it is, it is a book religion united around this belief, this really amazing belief um, that many find too amazing to believe, right? That, that God has spoken to us in a special way in Scripture. So Scripture has to be held in high esteem, uh, not 
not made into an idol, of course, um, but but respected and revered as a witness to the the triune God that we we serve and love. So, so I think that that attention, constant attention to Scripture as this as the this vehicle and means of revelation is so crucial. And I, I, the older I get, I wasn't, I wasn't raised in a creedal church per se. I was raised in a, in a low church tradition. But the older I get, the more I see the real richness of the early church tradition in the rule of faith, the kind of feedback loop between scripture and the creed. I think at the end of the day, the canon and the creeds are ways that, that we can, uh, we can preserve the language and make sure it doesn't drift so far that it becomes an entirely new language so that it stays within the language the language uh, tree and 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 is true to the original language that so it doesn't get so far off that uh, that there's a problem that can't be fixed Robert Jensen talks about this in his book Canon in Creed and he actually has a third thing that, that he would add in which is the the episcopos the the role of the of the teaching elder or, or whatnot and that too is I think an important point it, it to me it goes back to the language teacher maybe that's a clergy person maybe that's a parent teaching their child maybe it's a Sunday school teacher who's teaching children or adults but but that there's someone also who's doing their best to maintain fluency so I think these things the 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 leader uh, the canon of scripture and the creeds these are ways that we can be united as Christians around the things that are most important that have to be preserved at all costs. Mm. Thank you so much for that, and uh, thank you again for joining us today. Um, and another time, the book is "The Old Testament Is Dying: A Recommended or a Diagnosis and Recommended Treatment." Um, thank you for joining us, and we appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Brian. It was great to be with you. All the best to you and the in the ministry.